So I think we can get started. So hello everyone, uh, welcome to one more uh, YCC uh, Grand Rounds. Uh, I am Antonio Moro, Chief of uh, Neuro-Oncology, and today is my pleasure to introduce our wonderful speakers, both of whom uh, from our very own Cancer Center. The first speaker is Dr. Mira Goshen, uh, who is a professor of surgery uh, within oncology and Deputy Chief Medical Officer for Surgical Services at Smilo Cancer Hospital. Dr. Goshen earned his medical degree from Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine, and he also pursued an MBA at MIT, uh, as well as a fellowship in breast surgical oncology at Northwestern Memorial Hospital. Dr. Goshen is an innovator in tailoring surgery and therapy for women with early stage breast cancer, with funding support from the Breast Cancer Research Foundation and National Institutions of Health. He is the principal investigator of several phase two trials aiming to reduce the need for second surgeries or re-excisions in women with breast cancer, one of which uses innovative image-guided operating room capabilities to capture and remove all residual tumor utilizing MRI and mass spectrometry, uh, which is used at Yale's hybrid operating room. Prior to joining Yale, Dr. Gosha spent 17 years uh, in Boston at the Dana-Farber uh, Cancer Institute, where he was the inaugural and incumbent Dr. Abdul Mohsen and Sultana al Tuhahiri, the Distinguished Chair in Surgical Oncology. He also served as the Director of the Breast Surgical Oncology Fellowship at the Dana-Farber, uh, and was an associate professor of surgery at Harvard Medical School. So without further ado, Dr. Goshen, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that uh, kind introduction. And um, I'm excited to, to be here. I know we have uh, one hour and we're gonna try to go through uh, two talks. So I will do my best to stay on time. And although, you know, in the introduction, you talk about, you know, reducing and, you know, the need for surgery, minimizing surgery, one interest of mine early on when I finished or was in training and fellowship um, was uh, the role of uh, surgery in stage four breast cancer. And I'll kind of go through um, how the pendulum has really swung in actually two directions. So historically, stage four breast cancer has a medium survival. This is really older data before more uh, modern targeted therapies of less than two years. And really treatment has been chemotherapy, endocrine therapy, more recently targeted or molecular therapy. There has been some radiation to sites of metastatic disease. And, you know, interestingly, when people started looking at whether local regional therapy was being done, um, that number was actually fairly high. 35 to 60% of women were undergoing local regional therapy in the United States, when really it should have been reserved for palliation at the time. And then there was a question of whether there's any survival benefit in doing this. This is um, United States data. Certainly um, most women fortunately present with localized or regional disease, um, stage four uh, breast cancer in the United States. And this is very different when you look outside of the US is only about four to 6% of the population. You know, when I was taking my surgery boards, I would have really, I would have failed the room if I had suggested that we should do surgery in the stage four setting outside of palliation. Um, it was generally accepted that local therapy did not prolong survival. And there was some earlier data suggesting that there may be some stimulation of metastatic growth. However, we know that there are um, diseases in the stage four setting where resection of the primary and or metastatic tumor site could improve survival or does improve survival. For example, in colorectal disease, potentially with metastatic disease to the liver or in renal cell carcinoma. And there are good reasons to leave the primary alone and there may be reasons to resect the primary tumor. For example, it is very easy to measure disease as opposed to getting scans when you leave the primary tumor um, alone. There is morbidity associated with resection um, in, with even in uh, breast cancer surgery, certainly with mastectomy and more uh, complex closures and reconstructions that sometimes are re required. There was some early data suggesting sources of cytokines or angiogenesis inhibitors, which restrain growth could be released with uh, metastasis and really you know, a question on whether there is a survival benefit in, in this setting or not. We did use surgery in the palliation of symptoms, certainly fear of uncontrolled local disease, um, there was suggestion of uh, reducing the um, shedding of metastatic um, cells. And, um, you know, could it potentially, if you resect the site, provide more effective systemic therapy? 
Again, there was um, data in the ovarian cancer, renal cell cancer, and colorectal cancer setting um, about surgical debulking and surgical removal of disease. And again, this um, was work that I started about two, two and a half decades ago. So I say challenging the standard. So Seema Khan, who was uh, one of my attendings when I was a fellow, presented in 2002 in a uh, in, in a, not a major um, surgical society or oncology society, it was called Sur Central Surgical Society, um, looking at the National Cancer Database for um, women with stage four disease. You know, about 4% of patients in the US um, presented with stage four breast cancer. This was again in the 1990s. Uh, median age or mean age was 62, which is really in line with our average age of breast cancer uh, in the United States. And you know, she looked at 16,000 women over, a, I think it was a two or three year cohort period of time. And first, you know, thing that was surprising to us and to her and to others was that almost 60% of women underwent local therapy, about 60% underwent mastectomy, about 40% underwent um, breast conservation. Um, and, you know, you can see what the negative margin rates uh, were at the time. Not surprisingly, those that either did not undergo surgery or underwent mastectomy had larger um, burden of disease in terms of tumor size. And you know, she was the first to really present that you know, if you didn't do surgery, sur uh, survival was 20 months. If you did uh, breast conservation was 27 months. And if you did a mastectomy, 32 months. And again, suggesting that potentially there is a survival benefit in the surgical cohort. You know, those that had bone or soft tissue disease tended to do better. Certainly, if you had fewer sites of metastatic disease, your um, outcomes were better. Um, giving chemo and or endocrine or a combination of therapy ended up being um, of benefit. And this is something that Seema, uh, Dr. Khan has spent a lot of time on as well, and we'll get to the modern era, is on uh, margin positivity and whether um, that would influence outcome. So independent predictors of survival were the use of uh, systemic therapy, certainly the location of metastatic disease, the burden of uh, disease, and the type of surgical resection that was done. And really for four or five years, this presented at Central Surgical and published in surgery really didn't get much attention uh, until 2006 to 2009. So Gildy Babiera at MD Anderson decided to look at their um, stage four breast cancers um, the mean age was a little bit younger in their cohort. They were you know, somewhat surprised that about 40% of their patients underwent surgery, half had breast conservation, half had mastectomies. And you know, what we would probably expect is that the patients were younger, less likely to have nodal involvement, fewer uh, sites of metastatic disease um, in, in their cohort. And when they looked at um, their uh, follow-up for 32 months, there was a trend towards better overall survival in the surgery group. And there was a benefit in terms of metastatic progression-free uh, survival. Then in the JCO, and there was an uh, accompanying editorial by Monica Morrow in uh, 2006, um, and I think it was something about is the horse out of the barn, uh, there were 300 patients with metastatic disease with a Geneva uh, tumor or cancer registry uh, on the use of local therapy. And again, a little over half the patients didn't have surgery, but 127 patients did. Uh, most were mastectomies. They described breast conservation as tumorectomies, um, negative margins in about half, and uh, nodal surgery in about a quarter of patients. And this is just kind of a, the diagram breaking that down. Um, in a schematic or graph form. Uh, those that ended up undergoing surgery versus not were younger, uh, lower burden of disease in terms of the size of the tumor and uh, nodal disease, more likely again to have a single site of metastatic disease or um, and less likely to have visceral metastasis, more likely to undergo radiation. Uh, and the, you can see what the use of chemotherapy and, uh, and endocrine therapy was the same. And again, this you know, leads to the thought of potential selection bias. If you were able to resect uh, the tumor and get clear margins, there was um, a survival benefit uh, as opposed to those that did not undergo surgery or that had positive margins. And then Fields um, Group looked at the WASH U data over almost a decade, and about half of patients underwent surgery. This is a much 
longer uh, median follow-up of 142 months. Um, and again, there was a survival benefit for surgery versus not. And there, there is a theme in, in, in all this. Um, there was a 250 institution review uh, over almost a two decade um, uh, period of time. This was published as the Annals of Surgery by Blanchard. Again, about 60% had surgery in the stage four setting and survival was 27 months versus 17 months. So as I alluded to, there is selection bias, potentially younger women with smaller uh, tumors, less nodal involvement, fewer sites of metastatic disease. And this is kind of the differences between the studies from Sima Khan and Rapidi and Gildi Babiera. Um, and from the Wash U and the, the other data, again, younger women with smaller tumors, less nodal involvements and uh, fewer sites of metastatic disease had surgery. And certainly there have been a lot of attempts statistically and in terms of matching to be able to um, uh, look at whether that uh, difference continued or not. So this was a work that a previous resident of mine decided, well, let's look at the Brigham and Farber and Mass General data. And, you know, again, very similar to what everyone else did. You know, we had a pretty small cohort of patients, a little bit more modern era treatment. Um, about 40% of our patients had surgery in the stage four setting. And I found that actually pretty surprising to see it was that high. But we were actually the first group to look at whether the timing of diagnosis or surgery in relationship to the diagnosis of stage four disease made a difference or not. About 25 out of, out of those 61 patients had that um, surgery before stage four diagnosis. I'll go over why this is probably potentially important and 36 after stage four diagnosis. This is kind of hard to read, but again, those in the um, surgery group in terms of sites of uh, metastatic disease, um, very similar to previous studies um, with a surgery uh, group having fewer sites of metastatic disease versus those um, that did not undergo surgery. And again, if you underwent uh, surgery, you're more likely to get radiation therapy. So our median survival for in the surgery group was 3.52 years. And in the no surgery group, just like everyone else, 2.36 years. However, the timing of diagnosis of stage four disease before or after surgery, if it was done afterwards, that survival was four years versus before at 2.4 years. So, you know, we, you know, our group looked into this and could this be an example of the Will Rogers phenomenon? Honestly, two decades ago, if you asked me what that was, I didn't know. Um, the example that, uh, that Will Rogers used is that when the Okies left the state of Oklahoma for the state of California, they raised the, I, the average IQ of both states. So I'll let you guys ponder that as we, um, as we move on. So this was the first paper to suggest that, that maybe it's, there is no survival benefit in surgery. And it's really the timing of surgery in relationship to the diagnosis of stage four disease. This shows the difference um, between surgery and not, but when we looked at the timing, that difference went away. So then I asked another colleague of mine that we recruited, uh, Laura Dominici, we looked at the NCCN database of stage four breast cancer. Again, uh, a little bit more modern era, a thousand patients, a much larger group. Um, and then we did a match analysis of 236 non-surgery patients to 54 patients with, uh, that had surgery followed by drug therapy. And again, that survival benefit that was being seen in the surgery group um, versus non-surgery actually disappeared. Uh, survival is three and a half versus 3.4 years. We match her age, number of sites of metastatic disease, ER, her two sites of metastatic disease. And again, I and my, there was a very few of us who actually came out strongly against surgery in the stage four setting. And all I've been talking about is retrospective data. And obviously, you know, with this, um, you know, anything in the world of oncology, we want prospective data. So, the world of prospective data came from really a couple of brilliant folks. One is Rajway Badwe, who um, runs the breast service at Tata Memorial um, uh, in uh, Mumbai, India. Um, they ran the first randomized trial of surgical removal of primary tumor with lymph node um, um, surgery in the metastatic setting. Their um, endpoints were primary endpoint was uh, looking at uh, removal of the primary tumor and x-ray nodes on overall survival and progression. 
survival. And we're gonna go over a couple of the randomized trials that have been done. Uh, again, the Tata group and Rajoy, Rajoy Badway were the first, um, looked at 350 patients. They were randomizing early to surgery. Um, we'll go over to next to the, um, the Turkish uh, Medical Federation, which did drug therapy first, followed by surgery. And finally, we're gonna get to the ECOG trial in the United States that I helped with, with Sima Khan, uh, drug therapy first, followed by surgery. So uh, the group in India looked at randomizing women with stage four breast cancer to local regional therapy to none. Uh, they underwent local regional therapy and then if indicated anti-estrogen therapy. Um, in the no local regional therapy, they were followed by um, when indicated anti-estrogen therapy. Of note, it's important to know that there were in the time of HER2 positive breast cancer, none of the patients receive anti-HER2 therapy. So that's a criticism of the trial. But again, this was done, you know, dec started decades ago where, you know, anti-HER2 therapy um, was just, you know, getting approved in the United States and certainly in resource limited countries. Um, it's not something that was, um, you know, automatically approved and paid for. Uh, this is the matching. They matched the, you know, their patient population uh, very well. And looking at overall survival, there was actually no difference um, between the two groups. Uh, they tried breaking it down by menopausal status, numbers, uh, the sites of metastatic disease and number of sites of metastatic disease like with, that were done like the previous trials. And you can see uh, really no difference. Interestingly, distant progression-free survival was actually lower in the local regional therapy group as opposed to those that did not. And again, this is different than what we'll get to this, the, um, the Turkish and the US trial, they were diagnosed with stage four breast cancer, underwent surgery first, then followed by uh, adjuvant therapy. So Attila Saran, who's um, at Pittsburgh, but helped run uh, on behalf of the Turkish Federation of Society of Breast Disease on a uh, randomized trial of evaluating resection of primary breast tumor with women with stage four breast cancer. And these were actually simultaneous same day presentations at the San Antonio Breast Conference. Um, their early presentation in 2013 is actually ends up being different than what they ended up publishing. We'll spend a moment or two on that. Their primary goal was assess if early surgical treatment of the primary tumor in stage four disease affects overall survival. They also looked at progression-free survival quality of life and morbidity. Different than the Tata group, stage four breast cancer um, at presentation was randomized to systemic therapy, then local therapy for local progression versus initial local therapy, uh, then uh, systemic therapy, um, and then looking at overall survival. Uh, chemotherapy was given to all patients either immediately or after randomization. All uh, hormone receptor positive patients received anti-estrogen therapy, different than the Tata group, the HER2 positive uh, overexpressed received trastuzumab uh, therapy. Uh, most patients, un if they underwent uh, local therapy, underwent mastectomy. Uh, radiation was given to some patients with, with sites of metastatic disease. And early on, um, looking at the difference between surgery and those that just receive systemic therapy, there was no statistical difference uh, overall. When they broke it down by um, numbers of sites of metastatic disease, and if there was just a single site uh, versus multiple sites, um, in the solitary or oligometastatic setting, there was a suggestion potentially of survival benefit. And this is what they ended up uh, presenting at San Antonio um, in 2013. This wasn't actually published until five or six years later, and we'll go over that, while the Tata group, you know, pretty rapidly published in Lancet Oncology. So they had suggested the Attila's group, uh, Saran's group in the Turkish uh, Federation, that there was no statistically difference, uh, difference in overall survive at survival at early follow-up. Um, potentially those with limited um, um, numbers of sites of metastatic disease. And I know that's of interest of people here at Yale um, and uh, around the country of maybe that group behaves differently than others um, with uh, metastatic breast cancer. These are the randomized trials uh, that were, are or were underway in the primary endpoints are either survival or time to progression. So we've seen what happened in India, what happened in Turkey. Um, 
we're going to talk about ECOG and the next one that will actually report out will be the Japanese JCOG 1017 trial. So this kind of circles back to, you know, I think maybe if there's anyone who's um, in training that's watching is that, you know, two decades ago, I started as a fellow of Sima Khan's um, and watched the work that she did in the central surgical um, challenging the standards of and of providing local therapy, a suggestion that local therapy would be a survival, but then watching the retrospective data come out, then the prospective data, and then the US data. So I, I was the um, CLGB rep, which is now part of Alliance uh, for ECOG 20, uh, 2108. This was presented at 2020 in San Antonio. The publication honestly will be coming out hopefully in the next month, but until then, um, you know, it isn't published, presented, but it will be published very soon. So we know that from the Tata group that there was no survival with early local regional recurrence. And then again, I said that Attila Saran in 2018 presented that there was uh, no difference also in, um, in uh, local regional therapy in terms of survival. But with longer follow-up, their group actually suggested that there was an overall survival benefit there's a lot of issues with this paper and publication. Uh, and I, I, I and uh, others wrote an editorial that was simultaneously published with this, but, and, and we can discuss this in the, in the question and answer session, but there was a suggestion that there was a survival benefit. So there's conflicting data. ECOG 2108 um, started in 2011 with its last patients enrolled in 2015. In 2013, because of slow accrual, um, they did amend their um, their overall goal in the in the randomization, but basically the, in the U.S. or in North America, stage four de novo breast cancer, optimal systemic therapy, um, including obviously anti HER two therapy, if there was no uh, progression of distant disease followed by four to eight months of optimal systemic therapy, they either continued down the route of systemic therapy versus local, early local regional therapy. And again, this is something that Dr. Khan focuses a lot on is the complete uh, resection with free margins. Overall survival, just like I showed you with all the randomized trials, um, this is the breakdown in terms of um, uh, the patient cohorts for those that were re uh, registered, not randomized and uh, randomized. Again, anti-HER2 therapy was given when they were HER2 positive, certainly anti-estrogen therapy when ER and or PR positive. Um, the dropout, which is really not surprising, is those that had um, uh, more you know, advanced local disease was uh, ended up being um, higher in, in the initial systemic therapy as opposed to where the group that was stable or responding. Um, median age, a little bit younger than SEMA's earlier study, looking at, you know, the NCDB database by about six or seven years. Um, and then when you looked at those that were randomized to early local therapy, um, 109 received surgery, uh, 87 uh, achieved surgical uh, free margins, and, uh, and, and local regional therapy was at 74 uh, of those patients. Uh, the reasons why um, no surgery, some ended up refusing, some progressed, some was uh, made by MD decision. Finally, we were able in the U.S. to, to go back to what SEMA started in saying that there was a survival benefit. Now we come to the point of having randomized data from the U.S. and suggested that there is no overall survival benefit for women with stage four breast cancer. Um, this is with a uh, median follow-up of 53, uh, 53 months. Progression-free survival, uh, similarly, uh, no difference. Something that you know uh, we saw a suggestion of in the Tata group is that potentially in there a sub, a certain subtypes of uh, breast cancer that actually operating uh, may actually be a more of a detriment to not operating. So it's not necessarily even equivalent, but potentially worse. And maybe that's uh, seen in the triple negative uh, uh, breast cancer. Um, one thing, again, that, you know, uh, will be focused on a little bit in the paper uh, is that there is some benefit in terms of local regional progression free um, uh, survival, whether that's of how, how useful that is of, of an endpoint is uh, worth discussing. So kind of coming to conclusion is that early local therapy does not improve survival in patients with de novo metastatic breast cancer. 
um, that there was actually um, a higher local regional progression when local regional therapy um, was used at the primary site. Uh, again, there is a suggestion of um, uh, progression-free, um, you know, some local regional uh, therapy response in, in the stage four breast set, um, cancer setting. And again, the JCOG trial um, is still pending. And at least in my in, in my conclusions were that like in, in almost two and a half decades, we went, the pendulum was swung from, you know, no surgery to surgery to maybe surgery or no surgery to hopefully now no surgery, um, you know, outside of palliation. Although there is interest in you know, in the um, those with limited numbers of metastatic site or oligometastatic disease. I don't think the randomized data from Tata or the Turkish group supports uh, this. Um, and uh, the ECOG data that was presented at ASCO doesn't support this either, although the publication is still pending. And once that's out, then you guys can make your own judgment. So with that, I'd like to thank you for the privilege of the podium and um, look forward to talking. Thank you very much, Mira. Uh, we have a, a, a few questions here. So uh, for everyone, if you have questions, please uh, post them in the chat. So let me read some of the questions here. Uh, a question from Dr. Karen Adelson. Uh, she points out that there is a national trend toward doing more local therapy for metastatic disease, what she's calling a metastasectomy, I guess. So does this data uh, provide some warning for adoption of this trend outside of research studies? Yeah. Honestly, I think it, it it does, at least in breast cancer, that we really, you know, we may have an idea, we may have antidotes of when it works. And, you know, when you we looked at our data institutionally or many others did as well, you know, you have to really be, you know, careful for selection biases that, you know, are unintended, but certainly part of this. And I, I am really outside of the clinical trial or research setting, as Dr. Adelson suggested, um, really not a big fan of even, certainly not local therapy, but even metastatectomies uh, in that setting as well. And I know this is different than some other um, solid tumor types, um, but in the world of breast cancer, uh, yeah, there was retrospective data, there was conflict on that, then we waited for prospective data, there was co conflict on that on, well, it's not US data or European data, finally we get the US data and we're, you know, on the border of getting the publication out on that as well. Um, okay, and then I, so another question from uh, Dr. Peters. Uh, so did the ECOG trial allow any number of metastases? It seems like the general thought was that this may be helpful in low volume disease. So um, it did allow for uh, multiple sites of metastatic disease. I think the only real, um, from what I remember, and I actually enrolled a couple of patients to this trial, um, patients that couldn't were those with like leptomeningeal uh, disease that were excluded um, and maybe a handful of others. And again, I think this points to the you know, is low volume or oligometastatic disease different than those with uh, higher volumes or burden of disease? And again, a lot of people try to address those selection biases of like, you know, you know, is visceral mets or lung mets going to be different than soft tissue or bone mets? Um, I, again, outside of the research setting, I am really cautious of this. I'm glad that in my two decades, I've seen a, 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 a trend hopefully away from from, from local uh, regional therapy. Thank you. And, and Dr. David Rim uh, is asking, is it even possible to study cancer present at stage four since in this modern era, discovery of the cancer at stage four classifies the patients as having received below is the standard of care? Any comments? Meaning maybe I um, don't understand the question a hundred. So the, being diagnosed as stage four is below the standard of care. Well, I mean, we're obviously in the United States. I, I would say that, you know, because we have such a well-screened population that that number is relatively low, but it still is about, you know, again, four to 6%, depending on whether you look at C or NCDB or whatever data set. But I really like thinking of things well outside of the U.S. borders and certainly in, you know, sub-Saharan Africa or Asia and many other parts of the world, uh, 
um, you know, there are a lot of women who are presenting with stage four breast cancer and or a lot more patients presenting with stage four breast cancer. And, um, you know, should different options be considered in that setting? You know, it was nice that in, at least in, you know, in the work on, on stage four breast cancer and local regional therapy, that we had counterparts in India, in Turkey, uh, in Japan and others that were looking at this. And it wasn't just run by uh, the US and Europeans in terms of helping us answer those questions. Okay. And uh, well, how about the uh, role of the disease heterogeneity and uh, the different phenotypes and molecular phenotypes and treatment availables? And uh, how, what does that do to this paradigm? And in other words, I was wondering if, you know, if you have a great treatment, is it good to have surgery or not? Or maybe if you have a great treatment, it doesn't matter. Yeah, so that's, that's such a great question. And, you know, you get those, you know, um, you know, there's this young patient, you know, she's got like a couple of sites of maybe liver disease, you get anti HER2 therapy, everything disappears, you know, maybe she has a little bit of a, a lump or mass in the breast, but, you know, you know, you get the story, you know, she has young kids and a family and, you know, let's just, you know, it's easy, just take it out. You know, I, I really think that's, you know, the, you know, she's going to likely do well anyways, whether I do the lumpectomy or mastectomy or remove the lymph nodes, yes or no. And, and again, um, there's this, you know, making us or the patient feel better versus are we actually, you know, doing a benefit in terms of keeping them alive longer. And certainly, you know, breast surgery may not be, you know, as morbid as, you know, very large thoracic and intra-abdominal surgeries, but, you know, in this society, we put a lot of emphasis on, on breast and the breast cancer and, you know, removal of the breast. And then the question becomes in the stage four setting, if you do a mastectomy, how about doing reconstruction? Yes or no. And kind of where, where does that end? Or why don't you remove the opposite breast as well? And, you know, I've had those discussions time and time again, and, you know, I would hope we're making some of these decisions based on uh, data and the science and not what, like, you know, feels good or, or maybe the right thing to say at that moment. So I do think heterogeneity does make a difference, but I think it's probably going to do well regardless of what I do with my scalpel. Thank you. And Dr. Lusberg is pointing out that there are very aggressive tumors that present biological stage four, uh, particularly in younger women. So it's not necessarily substandard. Uh, care, which is bad biology, right? That was great. That's a great comment. Yes, wonderful. Thank you so much. So in the interest of time, we're going to move on to the next talk. Uh, for the next talk, we have uh, our very own Dr. Anita Hutner. Dr. Hutner is an associate professor of pathology who specializes in identifying diseases and cancers in the brain. She has received her medical degree from the University of Erlanger uh, Nuremberg in Germany and uh, completed a fellowship at Harvard uh, Medical School at the Brigham and her residency here at Yale New Haven Hospital. So in addition to her specialty in neuropathology, Dr. Hutner has studied molecular diagnostic pathology. So in her research, Dr. Hutner uses stem cells to try to recreate the brain's disorders uh, founding diseases like epilepsy and Alzheimer's disease and hopes to find better treatments for brain tumors. So today, Dr. Hutner will talk to us about a very important uh, update in the WHO classification of brain tumors that will uh, pretty much append the way we are uh, calling these diseases and classifying the disease and enrolling the patients in clinical trials. Uh, so we're very uh, fortunate to have her here to uh, educate us on that. Dr. Hutner. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you for this kind introduction. Um, thank you. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here and have the opportunity to share with you some insights into the upcoming 2021 WHO classification of CNS tumors. Um, it's now the fifth, and I'll um, talk more about that. Um, in general, you might wonder, well, why shall we even deal with brain tumors? Um, they're, they're relatively rare compared to other cancers. And when you look at the numbers in, in a bit more detail, you realize that, yes, while they are relatively rare compared to, let's say, breast, lung, and other entities, um, the, the outcome is rather devastating. So roughly estimated, we will 
find about 24,000 um, patients with a malignant glioma. The, the five-year survival rate is rather low, it's 36%, and the survivability rate for those who suffer with a glioblastoma is really low. So it's, it begs for innovation, this entire field. The costs of treating patients with brain tumors are tremendous. In, in, in simplified terms, but also very illustrative is uh, this graph here. When you look at the survival rates, the five-year survival rates of children with leukemia, you have now nine out of 10 surviving. Uh, patients with breast cancer, similarly, nine out of 10 survive. When you look at patients with brain cancer, now you're down to two per 10 surviving. And then with glioblastoma, you're down to one per 10. So you can see, even in 2021, the field is begging for innovation and new approaches to handle this absolutely devastating disease. And so we, this year, there is a new WHO classification of brain tumors um, coming out, which is dramatically or significantly different from before. And so I felt since we have a very large and active neuro, clinical neuroscience community here, it would be good to um, discuss a few of those new changes because they will affect how we all practice and interact. And so for today, I thought I'll show you um, a few, some of the general changes and recommendations, then go into tumor specific changes. And at the end, I'd like to conclude with one of our own cases and methadone analysis for brain tumors, which is now also recommended. And so why is it overall so important to accurately classify tumor samples? Well, there are multiple aspects. Um, it's Personalized, individualized patient care uh, it contributes to prognosis, um, aids in therapeutic guidance. It's cl cl uh, critical for clinical trial enrollment and also then for, for the interpretation of clinical trials data. The enrollment in experimental studies and here also um, data and, uh, and analysis interpretation, the evaluation of population-based disease trends um, are aided by an accurate classification system and also, you know, affected is allocation of resources by governments and health insurers to support healthcare. And so the WHO now publishes periodic revisions of tumor classifications, and these have therefore very diverse and important effects on many aspects actually of individual and population health. However, and David Lewis emphasized this at the last meeting all classifications are somewhat imperfect. There are imperfect representations and represent and of, um, of and the state of, and represent the state of understanding at a particular time and the interpretations of a limited number of experts. And so you see their limitations, their works in progress, yet they're still extremely needed. Just to shed light on the fifth, so the when you look at how the WHO classification emerged, the first one was published in 79, the first edition, then evolved over the years that the time gaps are at times quite considerable. Um, the um, from 20, from 2007 to 2016, there was an almost 10 year time span. However, the 2016 edition was a more or less a revised edition of the fourth edition, which is the 2007 version. And here, for the first time, uh, definitions were now based on the combination of morphologic and genetic characteristics. This was a huge shift in the field and a field that was celebrated by one, by some. There's a paper in cancer cell which caused it the fall of the optical wall, freedom from the tyranny of the microscope. And um, the molecular changes then could demonstrate uh, this improves glioma risk stratification. Um, the uh, 
from 2016 to now to 2021 again you know time passed and but now with the um, advents in uh, molecular technology uh, information is gathered at uh, light speed and so in order to bridge these gaps between WHO classifications, the um, um, a consortium was formed, the C Impact Now Consortium, which is a consortium to inform molecular and practical approaches to CNS tumor taxonomy. The goal here is to um, publish uh, new developments in molecular diagnostics and inform the clinical world. So this could be implemented along the way and there wouldn't be a long gap until new changes were implemented. If you wonder what the now stands for, it means not officially who, because this consortium was established in 2016 and basically the authors of all these C impact papers are also authors and editors of the new WHO classification. So it's a very, it's a very homogeneous uh, group that works on this. The, the expert ex editorial group is composed of an um, international group. Unfortunately, the blue book is not yet published there. I was told by David Lewis, um, there are production issues related to the pandemic. Um, however, in the meantime, a, um, a review paper came out in neuro-oncology, which is available and can be seen. And so I quickly would like to go through a few general changes before I go into tumor specific changes. And um, the, the significant change uh, is re related to the um, report structure. And here we have now a so-called integrated histomolecular classification system. It's already in place at Yale, and this is what one of our reports looks like. And so you have four layers. Layer two is the histopathological diagnosis, which would be here, for example, glioblastoma. Layer three then defines the grade, um, would be here four. And then layer four uh, forms the molecular information, which would be a list of uh, molecular data here. And in order to make sense out of these different components, a, a layer one is added, to, which forms the integrated diagnosis. And this is the combined tissue-based histological and molecular diagnosis. And so this is continuously expanding with the addition of additional newer markers. And the integrated diagnosis is really a collaborative team-based effort where we as neuropathologists form sort of a, a central role for the integration component. We closely work with neurosurgery, neurology, neuro-oncology, um, genetics, and neuroradiology, and then integrate, uh, form this integrated diagnosis, which then is used by neuro-oncology and radiation oncology for, for treatment. So it's a very intimately integrated process. Um, a few words to just a, a few nomenclature issues. So when a diagnosis cannot be made and uh, the, the term NOS is used, meaning non, not otherwise specified, this just means that molecular information is not available and there could be multiple reasons. It's either not available or not the test was not performed or simply was not successful. Whereas the NEC uh, term, not elsewhere classified, just indicates that the test was successfully performed. However, the test results simply do not fit into a known category. So further on, now in this new version, um, we're now distinguishing our grading from other classifications by adding the WHO's DNS grade, because this is meant to emphasize that the way the neuro, the, the neuro who grades tumors is different from how it's done in GYN or breast, for example. Further, um, the now we're switching, this might sound trivial, we're using Arabic numerals instead of Roman numerals. Um, and lastly, now is also grading within tumor types. And this is uh, a bit more substantial. This is meant to provide more flexibility in using grade relative to tumor type. 
it should emphasize biological similarities within tumor types rather than just approximate clinical behavior. And it should it conforms with who grading in non-CNS tumor types. For example, we used to say astrocytoma IDH mutant who CNS grade two or three or four. When you have uh, before you could say, for example, a um, you had the term anaplastic astrocytoma who grade three. This is now obsolete. Now it's replaced and uh, the nomenclature now would indicate that you have to say astrocytoma IDH mutant who CNS grade three. I think it will take a bit of time to get used to this over time. And the term glioblastoma now is exclusively reserved for the adult IDH wild type tumors. So the, the, the stratification is really based on IDH status. And so the tumor specific changes now go into this. So when you look at the uh, 2016 WHO list of tumors, it has a wide range of um, entities, uh, terms like emistocytic astrocytoma or here gliosarcoma, epithelial glioblastoma, all these have been removed. Everything has been streamlined and reduced to three main uh, groups. And these are the adult type diffuse gliomas, the pediatric type diffuse low-grade gliomas, and the pediatric type diffuse high-grade gliomas. The pediatric type does not mean these are exclusively present in pediatric patients, but they're often or more, more readily seen in pediatric patients. We now, when we look at this more closely, so the astrocytoma now, we're talking now specifically about diffuse gliomas. There now is, a, is the IDH uh, mutant status matters most. And the stratification is based on astrocytoma IDH mutant. And then the grading is based on grade two, three, and four for the oligodendrogliomas. Again, IDH mutant status is very relevant. In addition to that, the 1P19Q codeletion status. Again, here the CNS grade goes up to, from what, two to three. And the glioblastoma is exclusively reserved for IDH wild type tumors. And these are automatically who grade four tumors. The pediatric type diffuse low grade gliomas are now in, uh, now include diffuse astrocytomas with MIP and MIPL uh, mutations the angiocentric glioma, the polymorphous low-grade neuroepithelial tumor of the young, and then diffuse low-grade gliomas with MAP kinase alterations. So you see it's a very different group of tumors that's now uh, front and center stage within the diffuse glioma group. And then lastly, the high-grade glioma group includes now the H3K27 and altered tumors. A new entity, the H3G, 34 mutant group is now included, and also uh, a new group, the P diffuse P pediatric type high-grade glioma, which is H3 wild type and IDH wild type now with a high-grade grade four and nomenclature is part of it. And then the lastly, the infant type hemispheric glioma. For the adult type tumor tumors, there were also significant changes. So the diffusely infiltrative astrocytic, astrocytic glioma with an IDH mutation is morphologically in general well differentiated, lacks features of anaplasia, mitotic activities not detected or very low. And what is absent, and this is diagnostically relevant, is microvascular proliferation and necrosis. And also there cannot be a CDKN2A homozygous deletion. For the intermediate type here, formerly called anaplastic astrocytoma, this is now the astrocytoma IDH mutant, and now who CNS grade three, you have similar features, except that now you find focal or dispersed anaplasia, significant mitotic activity, but still no vascular proliferation or necrosis and no CDKN2A deletion, whereas for the highest grade now, which is no longer called glioblastoma, but this is the astrocytoma IDH mutant who's CNS grade four. You have features 
of a diffusely infiltrative astrocytic neoplasm with an IDH mutation that exhib exhibits also microvascular proliferation, necrosis, and in this case also CDK, CDKN2A homozygous deletion or any combination of these features. So overall, to the, the drive home point is the diagnosis anaplastic astrocytoma IDH mutant and glioblastoma IDH mutant are no longer recommended. And the CDK uh, N2A and B homozygous deletions are molecular markers of who CNS grade four in an IDH mutant astrocytoma. Um, the criteria for glioblastoma now are limited to exclusively IDH wild type tumors. And here you find diffuse astrocytic tumors with microvascular prol proliferation or in the past it used to be an end. Now it's just or you need one of those features or you have a molecular defined tumor, a third promoter mutation, EGFR gene, uh, EGF receptor gene amplification or plus seven minus 10 chromosome copy number changes. The, I, the IDH wild type diffuse glioma with any of these features is called a glioblastoma hook CNS grade four. So the question arises, how do you, you know, handle glioblastoma now? So there are two options. Um, and this is not necessarily trivial. So the case with a diffuse glioma without microvascular proliferation or necrosis, so without anaplastic features, histologically not really a glioblastoma, but it is a glioblastoma when it is IDH wild type and displays EGFR amplification, third promoter mutation, or plus seven minus 10. Ten. Whereas when you have a true histological glioblastoma where you see morphologic features of high of anaplasia like uh, vascular proliferation or necrosis, it's not a glioblastoma. It's then a, um, a histological glioblastoma with IDH mutation would then be an astrocytoma IDH mutant grade four. So the term glioblastoma is not used, it's astrocytoma IDH mutant who grade four. For the um, pediatric group, then we have the entities I already mentioned. I just wanted to point out the diffuse low-grade glioma with a macrokinase pathway alterations where you have several um, entities now within the FGF receptor um, category where you have uh, duplications, mutations, BRAF is involved, or again, CDKN2A. The pediat pediatric type diffuse tigre gliomas, this is a relatively unusual entity. And here you have um, involvement of PDGF receptor amplifications or EGFR amplifications or MUC. Others, when you then go beyond the diffuse gliomas, you look at uh, glioneuronal and neuronal tumors. I just want to point out there were a few additional tumors added, like the high-grade astrocytoma with pyeloid features within the glioneuronal and neuronal tumors, an unusual tumor, the diffuse glioneuronal tumor with oligodendroglioma like features and nuclear clusters, myxoid glioneuronal tumors, and the multinodular vacuolating neuronal tumor. Um, major changes were also seen uh, added to the ependymal tumors. Ependymal tumors are those with a relatively um, isomorphic uh, appearance, uh, which form pseudorosettes around vasculature. Um, they're linked to the ventricular system mostly. And so this was the original classification in 2016. Now, this is uh, abolished and the classification is now based on location, histology, and genetic alterations. And here you have uh, location-based supratentorial, infratentorial, uh, spinal, and then lastly, a few adi two additional entities, the myxopapillary ependymoma and the subependymoma. And when we look at those in, in greater detail, the supratentorial ependymomas used to be um, known with a real fusion partner. This has been changed now. 
the C11 open reading frame 95 now is designated as CFTA and has multiple fusion partners. These are usually hemispheric extraventricular tumors uh, in adults and children. And another odd option is also a YAP1 fusion positive tumor. The the infratentorial ependymomas are the posterior fossa ependymoma A, group A, or B. And these are primarily in infants have an extremely poor prognosis, are known to have H3K27M methylation um, loss. Whereas here you have a retention of the H3K27M in the B ones, and they have a bit better prognosis. The spinal ependymomas show often mixed C amplification. They are, are, uh, they are very malignant. Lastly, the myxopapular ependymoma was upgraded now to grade two. It used to be grade one. Uh, there's no additional molecular data to, to change anything. And similarly for the subependymoma, it stays the same. The embryonal tumors, I have seen uh, also significant um, changes. May, these are, as you can see here in the image, uh, very aggressive appearing blue cell tumors with high mitotic rate. And here we have now molecularly defined and histologically defined uh, tumors. In 2016, there were four subgroups um, and the, the medullable stomas were stratified according to um, pathways, which involved wind pathway, sonic hedgehog pathway, and then non-wind, non-sonic hedgehog. Um, the uh, wind pathway um, medulloblastoma had a relatively good prognosis, whereas the sonic hedgehog activated ones with a, TP, with a P53 mutation, in addition, had a very poor prognosis. Now in, in 2021, the sonic hedgehog pathway group went from two sub, subgroups to four subgroups. So those in, on the editorial board that were splitters one uh, rather than the lumpers. And so we have now more subgroups. Lastly, whenever you have MUC involved or P53, the survival goes down. Um, the, um, the uh, non-wind, non, uh, the, the group three and four now went from, um, you know, to eight subgroups, um, which is now a significant, um, almost hair splitting uh, um, attempt. And you also have here, wherever you have MUC involved, you have a lower survival time. We will see whether this uh, splitting medulloblastomas up uh, will hold over time. The molecular defined medulloblastomas, however, uh, demonstrate distinct associations with morphologic patterns. And here for, for all wind tumors, you see the classic type, which is a blue cell tumor. The sonic hedgehog group shows this desmoplastic nodular arrangement. Um, also, you have a similar feature, it's called the medulloblastoma with extensive nodularity. And the, the group three and four are usually large cell, very anaplastic appearing medulloblastomas. So for the medulloblastoma overall, it's more complex now, it's more split. Um, the tumor types, I'm just pointing out a change in red in grading. Um, the overall, to just summarize, there are 22 new entities um, within different subtypes, gliomas, glioneuronal, and ependymal. Um, embryonal has seen four sarcomas, three added, and there are several uh, changes. I will not uh, go through those, just to see there is quite a bit of modification. Lastly, I just wanted to make close with a case we had, and I thought we we're out of time almost, the methylome analysis for brain tumors. Um, in 2018, this paper came out by the German group on David Kappa, where methylation-based classification of central nervous system tumor was really 
um, a breakthrough in certain ways. The cancer methylome is really a combination of somatically acquired DNA methylation changes and characteristics that reflect the cell of origin. So you can trace the, the cell back to its origin. It also has been shown that this technology is highly robust and reproducible, even when you use very small samples and you have only poor quality material. And these profiles have been widely used and to classify CNS tumors. And this Disney plot here shows that there has been really a discovery of, of several new tumor entities. Technically, it's very straightforward to use where you use a, a paraffin embedded section, micro dissected, run the array, and then generate a report, which is then based on this um, 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 pattern here. And the, this new classification recommends DNA methylation studies done explicitly for several tumor types for example, the pediatric um, high-grade gliomas, the extraventricular neurocytomas, ependymomas, and also embryonal tumors. It's mandatory now for high-grade astrocytomas with pyloid features. It's the only way to really diagnose this tumor. And for the uh, diffuse glioneuronal tumors with oligodendroglioma-like features. Um, the case selection should follow cases with ambiguous tumor classification, which are some I mentioned already, for example, in a young adult with an, a malignant IDH wild type glioma is suspicious that should be looked at by methylome analysis, diffuse IDH wild type gliomas without necrosis, um, and so forth, embryonal tumors in general, ependymomas, the higher grade meningiomas will benefit from it and patients with putative uh, tumor syndromes. It also it aids in um, additional testing in complex cases. And here I wanted to briefly show one of the cases we had at Yale where methylome analysis actually resolved this case. So it was a nine-year-old female with a very complex heterogeneous uh, tumor uh, with uh, you know, enhancement, cystic degeneration, midline shift, no one was sure whether this is on the benign side of things or somewhat malignant. And so a biopsy then or a resection shows a very peculiar picture also where we have fields with embryonal type morphology, areas with pseudo rosette forming. This is almost astro astroblastoma like fields with sclerosis and there's more pleasure. There's nothing um, in our current WHO that would fit uh, these features. And so the, the immunohistochemistry was not helpful at all. We ran an enormously wide panel uh, without any conclusion. Um, lastly, sent it to, uh, N, uh, to uh, NYU um, for DNA methylation uh, studies. And here it came back to our surprise as a uh, tumor which matches a neuroepithelial tumor with MNN, MN1 alteration. This was confirmed with a fish. He, Chen Chu helped us out. And here we have now a um, probe that confirmed that the MN1 uh, arrangement is really truly the, the driving um, factor here. And so the high-grade neuroepithelial tumors, MN1, is, uh, is defined uh, as MN1 uh, rearrangement. It's a very new, a relatively new entity recently described. It has several bind binding partners, including uh, BEND2. Um, it, the methylation profiling shows it really splits off as a separate entity. It's distinctly different from others. So most of these high-grade CNS peanuts are grouped clusters within the reference um, group here. 24% form four clusters, and the uh, MN1 is one of them. And so in, in general, this cohort, uh, it sort of falls between astroblastoma, but also somewhat uh, high-grade. It was unsure morphologically what to do with it, but this now really helped us um, you know, stratify this tumor. And so um, 
It was initially reported in, in a menin tumor. In other tumors, it has been seen in AML. It's actually, it uh, improves survival, but I think there's not enough data to properly judge this um, uh, rearrangement here. And so where do we go from here? Um, the, the goal is to build and expand on a molecular neuropathology service here at Yale, embrace new developments, uh, embrace state-of-the-art technology, molecular markers, and so forth to improve on the statistics, uh, the image I showed you at the beginning of the talk, and continue to work very closely with all our clinical partners. And here we are. I'd like to acknowledge and thank a wide range of uh, colleagues from neurosurgery, neuro-oncology, my own group is a fantastic group of neuropathologists, neuroradiology, medical genetics, molecular genetic pathology, also again in my department, radiation oncology, and then many who work behind the scenes and help us um, along the way. And with that, thank you. I'm sorry I ran over. Thank, thank you very much, Anita. Any thank, thank you very much, Anita. So uh, I think we are running over time. So uh, I think questions will need to be addressed through email to you. So uh, uh, I think this is fantastic. And uh, I think it is one more example of where the oncology field is heading. Uh, usually brain tumors uh, lead the way in terms of incorporating molecular uh, studies and then other diseases follow. So it, it seems like uh, we're getting more complex and more sliced and if even rarer diseases. So a uh, big challenge ahead. So thank you everyone for attending. And once again, thank you for our uh, wonderful speakers. And uh, I hope to see you uh, next week, our next grand rounds. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.